Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramph. Uh, today we're talking about a lot of things. Uh, City Council had a pretty heated meeting during public comment. We got some uh, information about what's going on in terms of our um, homelessness issues and our Rogers International Security. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that during my City Council report. But one of the biggest things that are happening this week was the primary election results. So uh, it happened Tuesday. And we have Ryan Zinke uh, going against Monica Trunell in the Western District. While in the Eastern District, we have uh, Matt Rosendale uh, going up against Penny Ronning. Um, if I can talk out of turn, the Eastern District will pretty much be Republican-leaning, while the West, which has many left-leaning communities, still has a higher percentage of right-leaning voters. Oh, sorry, left-leaning. They do have, yeah, it's switch that. Uh, the West has been, uh, has the better chance than the East, but the nice thing about the U.S. Congress is that the West cannot influence the East, vice versa, so we're voting in our own district in the West here, uh, and they're voting in their own district in the East over there, and we'll see how it all turns out. Uh, we are now going to see a bunch of ads, and I will not talk about the election any further. Thank you very much. Moving on. Uh, gas prices keep on going up, folks, and um, uh, last week, we saw his numbers as high as $5 per gallon in Montana and Missoula County. For those poor folks in Sealy Lake area, according to one of our staff who drove up there last Sunday for the uh, Sealy Swan High School graduation, uh, saw prices break the $5 mark in the Missoula County. Uh, however, Missoula, as of Sunday, saw prices ranging from $4.69 to $4.89 throughout this whole entire week. And then just this morning, as I was driving through, I saw a gas price of $4.99, the highest I've seen it in a long time. And um, this weekend, you can pretty much expect to see $5 a gallon. Um, motorists in nine states, Alaska, Arizona, California, Hawaii, uh, uh, Illinois, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington are now paying more than $5 a gallon. Missoula, if not Montana, will join the $5 club soon. And many of these reports are out of ABC Montana. Right now, um, in terms of gas, uh, Biden is toting the line of conceding to Saudi Arabia for cheaper gas prices, but was running on the campaign to hold the Saudi prince and leader Mohammed bin Salman accountable for crimes against humanity and for wrongful execution in Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, fast forward to February of this year, and we got ourselves in quite a pickle between a country at war versus a country that had a 50-50 chance that they caused 9-11, according to uh, recent reports from the um, Secretary of State. So uh, other uh, executions by today's standards uh, would be because uh, you know they um, yeah so I'm just giving you kind of the cliff notes on this and the only way for the US to get cheaper gas is to either to drill and refine in America or sell military equipment to the Saudis which may be used in uh, Yemen um, where starving kids are starving to death and while many of their cities are in shambles. The only saving grace for thus far is Venezuela as they're going through their own um, uh, turmoil in terms of uh, changing hands of power, which is currently going through its own political strife. But hey, at least there's a chance for cheaper oil with another tyrannical leader there as well. So Venezuela holds 201 trillion cubic feet of proven gas reserves as of 2017, ranking eighth in the world and accounting for about 3% of the world's total natural gas reserves of 6,923. And according to Google, their gas reserve could last up to 1,300 years. Uh, but who knows how much gas will go through and what the population might affect that as well. But it kind of makes you think, you know, maybe electric cars might actually be a good thing, uh, which brings me to, you guessed it, Build Back Better. Yes, part of the deal was to add the EV fill stations. So those are like kind of like uh, gas stations for electric vehicles. So they want to put over 50,000 uh, across the uh, United States um, to phase out gas facility, gas vehicles within maybe 30 years because they need long range numbers that they can uh, put off for a while. Anyways, according to NBC News, Build Back Better uh, proposed the uh, building of 50,000 EV charge stations across the U.S. as part of the president's plan to address greenhouse gas emissions. The bill originally proposed 15 billion, but was cut in half to 7.5 billion. 
and they will be going to the states and they will determine the best places for these EV fill stations. That being said, there are different levels of chain charge stations and so far Tesla supercharged stations which are near Grant Creek's uh, gas station cuts down charge time. There are approximately three different kind of levels of EV charge. I'll give you a little bit of rundown. Level three is 100 miles per one hour of charge. So you leave it charging for an hour, you get 100 miles on your car. And then the next level, level two, which is the next lowest, which is about 15 to 35 miles uh, per hour of charge. And then it's even worse for the, uh, the lowest one, which is considered level one, which is you get about two or six miles per hour of charge time. So, you know, however, charging from home overnight is always a full, uh, available for uh, many EV cars that actually come with a hookup. Anyways, I feel like I'm doing an ad, so I'll stop there. Uh, it's going to take time to lower uh, earners to have opportunity to buy electric vehicles. Even Priuses have been con that have been converted are still at a $28,000 minimum price. So a lot of chances, uh, not for a lot of people, but I think a lot of the only way people are going to get into the electronic um, car market is if they buy it used. So. A lot of uh, food for thought for sure. Um, and, you know, we're talking a little bit about housing. And this kind of story uh, caught my eye earlier this week from NPR is that Cuba is uh, basically, there's a lot of homes for sale up in Cuba as low as fifteen to $35,000. Um, it's kind of crazy, a lot of their pr prices and everything like that. But a lot of people in Cuba are wanting to get out. In April alone, U.S. Uh, authorities rec recorded more than 35,000 Cuban nationals at the U.S. southwest border, almost as much as the entire 2021 fiscal year. According to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, they're fleeing mainly because Cuba is struggling through a steep economic downturn. It's not hard to imagine a country with complete military government control to help only those loyal to the military complex, but for those just living in Cuba, life is hard. I mean, if, it, if this was Fidel Castro's times, you can bet any and all people were under suspicion at all times, and when it came to refugees, it was hard to get out of Cuba, let alone stay out of Cuba. Some people are selling homes as low as $15,000 uh, so they can just afford to get out of their country, lock up opportunities in government that restrict a lot of people because of COVID-19 resulted in more uh, damage than good in this already vulnerable country that has barely had a working car between a single family. So, so far uh, there are 2,000 listings in homes in Cuba looking to get out while they're getting good. So there's a lot of interesting things happening on here. And, you know, in many places, if there's not a lot of resources, a lot of other places, the uh, overall uh, custom is just to leave. It's, it's really just kind of unfortunate because there's a lot of people that want to stay and live in Missoula. And we'll get to that through my city council report later in the show. But for right now, we have something to kind of entertain you guys this summer. It's the Missoula City Band and Gary Gillette stop by to talk a little bit more about this and many other events that the Missoula City Band will be hosting. As soon as it plays. Sorry about that. Let's get it going. Here you go. You put yourself in the, in the shot. Well, too, yeah, because I'm interviewing you. It's not like I'm going to stand behind the camera already. <laughs> hey, guys, welcome. This I is can't Gary. remember. <laughs> this is Gary Gillette. We are here talking about the uh, Missoula City Band, which, once again, this <laughs> summer, every Wednesday, concert, 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 concert. Forever and ever and ever. And this year being, uh, it's, it's probably... Uh, not right to say COVID free, but it feels that way because everything we do is outside. So we don't have any, we don't have any hoops to jump through. Well, it's, it's not necessarily like COVID free. I think it's more that's like right. COVID ignored. Yeah, okay, that's what it is. That's it. Well, anybody is welcome to take whatever precautions yeah. individuals mm -hmm. care to do. If you want to wear a mask and come, to, if you want to sit away apart from everybody else, yeah. go sit in the baseball field. That's okay. Yeah. We, but also be aware that some of the old blue hairs will be uh, in, in <laughs> attendance. So show some respect for them. That's as right, well. and because I've been contacted by some of the uh, the uh, the larger uh, houses in town that uh, the, the 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 special buses will be pulling up, and the blue hairs will be uh, unloading and enjoying themselves at a city band concert. Nice. And what what, what, what they, can they what can they expect from the uh, band concert this summer? Well, so we're starting a week early, and it was because of this the glorious 125th anniversary of the Iron Riders. Now, I never knew the name Iron Riders. Uh, it's been called the Bicycle Corps. That's how I know it. Oh, right. From Fort Missoula, 125 years ago, next week, uh, was their final uh, adventure, mm -hmm. where they rode their freaking bicycles from Fort Missoula, Montana, all the way to St. Louis. 
Wow. And it took them several months. And uh, when they got to St. Louis, I, I, I shan't forget uh, to mention this. They got to St. Louis, beat up and tattered. And the experiment was like, oh. And they loaded the bicycles on the railroad cars and shipped them back to the factory on the East Coast. And that was the end of the experiment yep. of supplanting horses as the main uh, uh, vehicle for yeah. cavalry. And this was well before highways, so <laughs> yes. you'd lucky to get a dirt road. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. It, you know, it followed it, it, you know, railroad tracks. It was 1897. Uh, so there were some railroad tracks. And so, Wait, and, are we and, talking about CD band? I feel and, like we're in Fort Missoula. Yeah, I know it. I know. And uh, so we are we are laying tribute to this uh, uh, humor, humorous historical uh, item that I find. Yeah. Uh, uh, the 125th anniversary of that, and so the city band is doing a concert next Wednesday uh, of of music that the band played 125 years ago because the band was here. Maybe more important than the bicyclists, but the <laughs> band was here at Fort Missoula as well. Nice. And when is this happening? It's, it's going to be our first concert of the year, which is Wednesday, what is that, the 15th, 6th, 7th, 8th? I think, I think yes. it's the 15th. Yep. Next Wednesday, uh, 8 o'clock, and that will start our summer off of every single Wednesday at 8 o'clock until, until the, the, the cows come home. Yep. Mid-August, Mid I think is what it is. Yeah, so the cows come home in August. That's right. Yeah. That's what I hear. That's what farmers tell yeah, me. Yeah, that's what they always say. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, we're, we're doing a special um, uh, exchange this year with the Bitterick Community Band, okay. which I started when I lived down there 100 years ago, um, just before the bicycle course, as a matter of fact. Uh, and uh, we're uh, doing a program together, so we're going to... Uh, they're coming up here and sharing our band uh, stage with us. Oh. And then we're going down there for Daily Days, oh, nice. which is the third Saturday in uh, uh, July. And we're going to play a concert on the lawn of the Daily Mansion. And at the oh, same time, wow. as though it's going to be a 2 o'clock gig, it'll be a, a great gig out there in the lawn. And it's also a brew fest. Now, for me... That's the best. Of, <laughs> that's the best of both worlds. Where's right? Gary? He's at the beer gardens. It's like, can someone get him? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. He, he's test, uh, testing things. Yeah, he's testing. So uh, uh, it, it's fun. I, I I typically go down there and do a, a gig with the the Bitterit Band because it's such a beautiful venue. And yeah. then uh, if you haven't been inside to tour the house, oh man, they've made it's improvements. So beautiful. It's beautiful in that yard. I even played a gig one time in the in the swimming pool. There's a it, there's a a, a sunken swimming pool behind the, the Daily Mansion, and they they no longer keep water in it, but it's a neat place to play. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard for the audience because they got to look over the edge, but it's fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they so. get a good vantage point looking down on us. <laughs> That's it. Look at that. What the heck is that going on? And they're here? just like, this is exactly how Marcus Daly felt when he was looking down at his band in the pool. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Oh, play some more. Entertain <laughs> folks. So we're going to do a concert of movie themes at one time, and we're nice. going to do oh, a new one this year my daughter-in-law suggested, TV themes. Oh. So I got a whole boatload full of cheesy TV themes that uh, we'll play. Uh, I can name that tune. and. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of other special things. Oh, um, of course, you know the, the special song that plays every year is your uh, uh, claim that, to fame. And it will be... The on, the usual, March. on the usual time, but since we're starting a week early, it won't be the first concert because I'm afraid it was written after the uh, 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 newer than 125 years ago. Uh, so we'll do that in the, in the second week of uh, our concerts. Nice. My, my, and, you know, I've, I found out that, indeed, I've, it's the Gillette Look Sharp March, and it was the theme for Friday Night Fights, which Gillette Razors and Foamy... Uh, uh, shaving cream. Yep. <coughs> they would um, uh, sponsor the the boxing fights, and uh, uh, my claim to fame was that you know it is Gillette, but I I never got any of the money, and yeah. that's not my family. But it I, I yeah. between Susan. You don't Hintz, see many boxers with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that indeed uh, that is my kin. Now it's quite removed, and there was an <laughs> e in the last name because my Gillettes lived in a town. My my kin lived. And there was another, another Gillette family moved in the same town. Yep. And so uh, the mail was getting uh, uh, waylaid. So my family uh, uh, off 
oh. offered to take the E off of our last name. But it doesn't yep. mean I no longer... And because of that, <laughs> we have E equals MC squared. There it Thank is. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> ah, dang, the magic of science. The magic of science. Ah, yep. But I am related to the Gillette Look Sharp March, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, the grandest march ever. Uh, Star Spangled Bear. Yeah. Stars and Stripes Forever. That was a great yeah, march. Yeah, non-Americana. <laughs> hey, to look sharp, got to be Gillette. Yeah. I, it's a great march. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, of course. I appreciate that. Well, uh, I appreciate you coming down here. Once again, it starts on Wednesday and every single Wednesday all throughout the summer. Um, I bring a bring along a lawn, lawn chair. chair. There's no chairs provided. Uh, you can I, sit on the grass. Bring yep, a blanket. A blanket maybe. You could bring. Yeah. There's usually a, usually Big Dipper comes by and sells their wear, or you could bring your dinner or anything that you want, bring along, come and enjoy a piece of Americana that exists in very few places around the world. Yep. A free concert of great music every single Wednesday. Yep. There you go. See you there, huh? See you there. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It is time for Pre-Critic, where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing but the my Prejudices? That's the word. All right, let's kick things off. We're kicking things off with Jurassic World Dominion. Welcome to a series of conclusions to this Jurassic World movie franchise that we rebooted and got enough money just to justify a sequel. Hey, if you make if you, if you make money, why are you gonna not make money? That's how movie. That's how the movie business works, kids. Watch dinosaurs teased from the previous film in our world, but this time as the dinosaurs exist in our world. Actually, perhaps maybe not, but they're just kind of like doing a gotta catch them all kind of uh, globe trotting adventure kind of deal. So, anyways, um, <coughs> so now it's kind of like they're exterminators. It's kind of like the Ghostbusters of the dinosaur world. That's what I'm assuming what this whole thing is about. Watch a series of disaster film elements of people getting eaten, but still adhere to the PG-13 rating, so no blood. Uh, that's not too graphic, uh, but still watch uh, some bad CGI, because honestly, CGI only looks really bad when you pair it up with live action people as well. So I'm assuming man will go too far in many places and the bad guys using the dinosaurs as, you know, evil ways and they'll get their come up and I swear to you that's just the way it is. Good guys capture and monitor animals like fish, wildlife, and parks. Anyways, moving on to the next one, The Righteous. Um, I'm, it's, uh, it wasn't people laughing or judging this film, it was God. Enjoy yet another take on be careful what you who you let into your home because they could be the devil. Uh, this follows a God-fearing family take in a stranger that causes them more challenges than they are able to deal with, all while unknown acts of, you guessed it, God make this poor couple challenge their faith, and this random guy who wants to test them at every turn, which results in stranger either being some guy or a bigger overlying story. Remember when, you know, um, uh, The Preacher's Wife, you know, you had a, a, a bivalent uh, soul and it wasn't a horror film or whatever. It was just kind of like, this guy's here to help. He's a magical man or whatever. Uh, those are good days. Also not good days. Hmm. Makes you think. Moving on to the last thing. We got an animated movie out there. Yes. It's called Chicken Hair and the Hamster of Darkness. I feel as though they just like got a dartboard and had a bunch of random words there and just decided to throw it there. So as I like to call it, Indiana Jones Anamorphic Animal Nightmare. Watch a kid's movie about a chicken rabbit hybrid thing, go on a journey of self-discovery and learning to accept oneself no matter how different they may seem. That's basically the through line of the story. They're overcoming the overcoming genetic shortcomings in this movie with cute animals with 2015 mo modern movie references that are 10 years old as soon as they were popular. Uh, Wide-eyed explorer, love interest, sassy friend, and bad guy hell-bent on getting the hamster of darkness that could unleash the whole bag of trouble for the hero to save the day last minute or just stumble upon it. Kind of like Raiders of the Lost Ark, which uh, Indiana Jones was completely pointless in because it would have ended with all the Nazis dying anyways. Anyways, I'm pretty sure they're not going to have notches in this movie, except for the trolls that comment on this particular um, movie. Hmm. Anyways, uh, <laughs> those are your movies that are coming out this weekend. I have a movie for you guys. It's called Hitchhike Lady. It is a movie, a clip that I have redubbed for your pleasure. Oh, oh man, my bunions are acting up. Oh, is that why they called him Paul Bunyan? It would make sense, my dear. He was so big, he probably had a whole bunch of bunions on his feet. 
Oh, uh, now don't get stressed. We're going to get out of here, My shoes okay? are not meant for walking. All my other shoes are high heels. Why don't you take a seat? I'll be on the lookout for some cars. Maybe I'll get lucky. Oh, there's a car. Yes, I'm lucky. Huh? Oh, stop. I can't stop. get up. We're over here. Help. We're blocking the road. Help. You have to stop. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, kind of looks good. Don't sass me. What are you ladies doing out here in the middle of nowhere? Fine. Where are your parents? Well, my mom's, like, right next to me. You guys shouldn't be on a old, lonely road. In this economy, our car broke down, and there's no way. Whoop, 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 whoop. That's the sound of me. Hey, guys, how's it going? Hey, hold on a second. Oh, what are don't you, you doing manhandle here? me. Unmarried women must be thrown in jail. Is he, is he right? Is this, is that true? Whoa, 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 hold on a second. These ladies are with me. See, she's my uh, fiancé, and we're about to get married, so... <laughs> Mwah. See, Ew. she's all with me. Oh, jeez, what is this, family feud? Well, since it is the 30s and you are a man, I'm going to have to let you go. <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? Come on, ladies, let's get going. I'll acknowledge you, Mr. Policeman, but no one else will. Do, do, do. What? I had to ham it up. Yep. There you go, let's put the bags in there. See ya. So I told my buddies Cheech and Chong that sometimes dreams can be nightmares. I guess that makes sense. Don't worry, we'll be in California soon where the police- I'm hungry. Well, you're gonna have to find out for yourself. <laughs> well, it is what it is. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. <laughs> my aunt says the craziest things. Come on, pull over. Well, the next dress area is about 10 I miles. I just want to stretch my legs. Come on, please. Come guys, on, Guys, just relax. We're gonna get there on time. No worries. Besides, you're in good hands. You've been walking for umpteen miles, and now you have a ride. The Ford Model T now comes in reverse. Hey, uh, why are we uh, driving in the coach and then... What I tell you, you better shut your mouth. I got a bow tie, and I'm not afraid to use it. Well, I just think that it's kind of a... Uh, what? You better say it. You really changed ever since you got that bow tie, you know? Oh, thank you. Oh, I just wanted to stretch my legs. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Let's check out the back. Hey, I totally forgot that this trailer is very comfortable and good for lying down. Let's go check out what's inside. After you. Uh, what's going huh? on? Guys, what are you doing in here? I said no speakeasies. Hey guys, we're back. Now let's talk about some city council. It's, uh, yeah, it's it, it's definitely, I have a lot of clips I got to go through, and there's a lot to talk about for sure. We had a full uh, episode devoted to Grant Creek last week. Primarily, the city leaned more towards rezoning the area, uh, and the actual development agreement posed the infrastructure and safety of the roads going to and from the development per impact studies. However, people in the neighborhood via friends of uh, Grant Creek opposed the rezoning, asked a lot of the neighbors who just uh, unanimously just don't like the idea of this. The city as a whole is looking to increase housing stock and basically disregarding concerns and covering the safety concerns, which if you look at it, uh, was not really much of a big argument or big deal, uh, just in terms of like emergency services and stuff like that. But let's call it what it is, development that the people up in Grant Creek just don't want. And the whole Wednesday meeting was basically to uh, cover a lot of the issues that a lot of people pose, which didn't really have anything to do with the underlying issue, which is like they just don't want development. So um, in terms of uh, they inline folks on uh, access, fire evacuation procedures, and the city covered this. Uh, so far, the city voted to continue this until uh, June 23rd, June, June 27th. And I think the one of the big things that with this rezoning is they're using the re rezoning at a leverage to do what's called impact fees. So essentially, when the developer uh, does developing, there's an agreement because of this rezoning to leverage development to be like, hey, you know, we want to also improve the suits and stuff like that. Do you think you guys can play ball and help us with this as you're also improving the housing, but also improve the roads and the areas around there as well. So the development services and the state of Missoula are looking to also not only add housing stock, but add um, safer routes and easier access to the Grant Creek area. So, all right, um, that's kind of what they kind of settled on for right now. I'm not going to get into it just because this is kind of like they just basically 
uh, push the change a little bit further down the line. So uh, we'll talk about this again as they when they bring it up the next time. So public comment got very heated, and uh, this is just one of many people who are struggling with uh, just basic housing in Missoula. And this is, uh, uh, I warn you, this, this thing it, it gets pretty uh, hot and heated. I have three minutes to get 20 years of accountability back in my life. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? You defamed and slandered me in a Missoulian article. The Missoulian even said, oh, we're just repeating what the city told us. You destroyed my life. You stole my rental properties with one of your police officers. You kicked me out of the HUD program. We had rentals. I was making income. <laughs> and none of you care. How do I get accountability? The police commission? <laughs> That's a joke. What happens? Where do I come for accountability? I want 20 years of my life back. You shove me into the homeless hole, and then you call me every dirty name in the book. And then I get this, I don't even know what to call it. Three months ago, you come up with this. We were just made aware of Desert Rain versus the city of Los Angeles. Go back in your records, 2015, I stood in front of this body, and I told you it was legal. 37 tickets for camping in the city later. Here I sit, a veteran who's now in veteran housing. Did you help me get into veteran housing? Not a damn one of you. And then I got 350 of these. What are these? Huh? No, that's not abusive. Each one of them is anonymous. Anonymous. So you can call, you can call in, or you can call in and say, hey, his, his vehicles are in my house, in my yard. Come, come write this tag on it and then steal it with your impounds and take $6,000 from a man who has no money, who's trying to get back on his feet. And then you do it through red sewing, who doesn't even pay the state living wage, which he's agreed to when they contract with the city. And then what do you do? Your dad writes a letter saying, Mr. Ulrich, you come into City Hall, you're going to be arrested. Why? I've never threatened anyone. Never threatened anyone, but you banish me from City Hall? The truth kills you people. You can't stand the truth. 350 of those in two and a half years. Tell me where there's justice, equality, adversity, inclusion. That sounds like the Constitution. Good day. Jesus Christ. All right. So that was... Um... Um, John Ulrich, um, and, and honestly, I'm, I mean, things in Missoula are not as good as it may seem, and his story is just one of many, but most of these folks are just too busy with trying to pay rent or whatever bills they have, fines, and just plain price gouging from every uh, growing market in the landlord market in Missoula. The public comment to me is just the tip of the iceberg, and people like John are just too busy to voice their concerns because many of them are too worried about finding a place to live, let alone finding satisfying income. Um, so far, this this is kind of like a, a springboard to get into housing. The city is working towards a series of uh, grants and policies that would benefit Missoula in terms of affordable housing, but just not in the short term. We have a lot of uh, things in the work down the line and everything like that, and Gwen Jones um, talks about CBD, uh, block and various other grants that will be uh, going towards affordable housing. Um, so here is, um, oh wait, this is actually was, Heidi West, excuse me. I was really excited to see the, the breadth of projects that were funded this year, including um, a, the, a land uh, purchase underneath um, an apartment house, uh, apartment on the north side, which is going to be either, um, I think the, you know what the model of ownership structure for the apartment is going to be is still up to be determined um, but i really like seeing um, a community land trust diversifying the their housing portfolio um, and serving a variety of housing needs um, and there's lots of other exciting exciting projects in the works of course many of the projects that you might have already heard of was the trinity navigation center and it's going to be a lot of things happening with that and i am actually going to refer back to it later in the meeting as we get into all nations doing a memorandum of understanding during one of the housing affordability uh, committee meetings that they did on wednesday so uh Villaggio, uh, Burlington Street, Wolf Street programs geared towards home ownership um, it's going to be about half a million dollars in cbd Three hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars in home, three hundred fifty-five for the affordable housing trust fund. Um, so there's just a lot of stuff going on with that, and the affordable housing trust fund is a very important uh, piece of this because they're part of a community that is community driven and. Um, it's used to find a lot of the great projects they've been working on. And so far they've funded um, projects like United Way of Missoula to help people with rental assistance and also with uh, uh, also geared towards, what was that? Um, um, Habitat for, for Humanity for two homes 
it's it's not it's not as much as they would like, but it is uh, uh, a clear straight line to affordable housing. So up next, we'll talk about it. Uh, you guessed it. No, you didn't guess it. It's the aquifer. Uh, Todd Lieb, water uh, quality specialist, talks about the double-edged sword of having our own water source, and this is what he had to say. It's, it's very productive. You know, the tertiary sediments in our valley, uh, made up of coarse sand and gravel, allow us to have a ton of water. It's one of the most productive and fast-moving aquifers in the country, um, and we're really fortunate to have that. Um, there's a flip side to that coin, though, because those same those same features that allow us to have so much water also make it very vulnerable to contamination. Um, there's really no natural protection from us um, to, to the water that's beneath our feet. So, you know, if you imagined a, a leaking uh, septic tank or even a, um, you know, a, a gas station leak or a spill uh, somewhere in the valley, eventually it would move through our valley um, to our, our discharge area. So, so what do we do with, without this natural protection? Um, I think what we do is we become the protection ourselves, right? So we, we invest in infrastructure, we change our behaviors uh, to protect this as a community because this is a community resource. And so this ordinance really seeks to do that. All right. So one of the big things that Todd Lieb is bringing up is like this is kind of like the history and what it's all about. And um, they want to update this uh, uh, water quality ordinance. They also did talk about air and other things during this uh, meeting as well. Milltown Dan was one of the many sources of contamination before it was removal um, re removed. Uh, federal government considers Missoula as a sole water source because what we drink is right below us and we don't need major pipeline to del deliver us water. Um, one of the bigger things proposed was to tighten up on how folks uh, get rid of hazardous waste from excess paint, grease, restaurants, laundry runoff, you know, some of the soaps. Um, some of the one of the big things was uh, how they were going to handle any kind of like gas spill, gasoline spill at gas stations. Uh, Todd Lieb uh, uh, talks about how they uh, came to tightening a lot of this stuff, and it was all community driven by concern. You know, this this idea of best management practices for these things uh, kind of came out organically from just answering a lot of the same questions and getting, you know, complaints about about certain things. And and I, I believe that you know if we can. We have to let people know what's best before we can expect it, and so that's that's kind of the the exciting part of this 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 rewrite is we've taken all these best management practices that were existing in the ordinance, moved them to a manual, and then added a lot of these common ones as well. So the big goals of the revision um, were to incorporate what was becoming policy, uh, right? So here's how we should tell people to you know control their sediment so they don't pollute, um, and really put those into into code. Yep. So that was a big chunk of that uh, part of there as well. And like I said before, I was uh, addressing some of the things in terms of, you know, gasoline contaminants and stuff like that. Uh, gas stations were, uh, you know, the potential for runoff from them and get and getting them to tighten up their overall uh, cause do not count contaminate our aquifer. So these uh, absorbents at gas stations to clean up. But for Todd, they but for Todd, there might be those. Uh, things that they've been using in the past might not be um, appropriate for today in terms of how their standards are dealing with this. So fueling facility drainage. You know, some of these things just can't, they're accidents, you know, they can't be prevented. Um, so we need to make sure the fuel doesn't go where we don't want it to. So the fueling island collision in 2010, um, someone overfilling their vehicle in 2015 and um, you know, stations that have this drainage are currently required to have absorbents on hand, but you can see it barely uh, you gotta get to it fast and it barely does, does the job. Yeah. And you can kind of see there as well that it, it, like they can put some sand, they can put some stuff down as much as they want, but it's just, a lot of times it just doesn't cut it in terms of just how much effort is being put into it. Cause yeah, I mean, storm runoff, st uh, storm water is such a big part of Missoula, especially as they're gearing up. And like something that I really haven't heard about in still like the last five years, and they uh, comprehensively rolled it up with your water bill as well. So every month, that's why you're paying the forty dollars a month rather than the original like twenty four dollars a month, and then you're paying wastewater and um, sewer separately. And this is probably their second official year that they're part of when they uh, comprehensively combined those two fees together. Todd exercise businesses that work with chemicals to revert to the BMP manuals, which is the best management practices, which has been, which hasn't necessarily been updated since 2014, mind you, 
before going forward with various businesses that work with contaminants. So this was a way for uh, one of the many boards of health and human safety to refer to potential contaminants. The next one was the air pollution. And you know, this is both the uh, county and city related. Uh, I mean, they are talking about county just in general in terms of Missoula. Um, and I remember hearing that Missoula produces of upwards of 18,562 metric tons of carbon that gets re released into the air annually, most of which comes from wastewater and water, which accounts for 58% of all that stuff. And the city of Missoula is even working towards uh, reducing that from the uh, water treatment facility um, f within the next 10, 20 years. So they also spoke with uh, wood fire stoves, which uh, Mountain, uh, Montana law reflected the change to prevent coal and wet wood from being burned from inside the homes. However, um, a lot of the places that where the uh, this uh, wood stove fire is actually part of the infrastructure of the building. A lot of them are kind of grandfathered in, but they do give a $500 tax credit for those who uh, transfer out of wood stoves. Benjamin Schmidt um, for, with the air quality specialist of Missoula County spoke on wood burning fireplaces, which also included stoves. Uh, the fireplaces in our rules are defined as masonry constructions that are structurally part of the home. Uh, the rule changes do not impact those. When a property sells, the fireplace would be allowed to remain uh, and they could be used except during air alerts. Now during air alerts, no fireplace is allowed to be used uh, uh, at any time at then. Yep. And most of it was because, you know, during the fire season, embers, they want to prevent that kind of stuff. And even in high fire danger, there might be some um, allocation to prevent that from going on. But so f there is a higher particular matter. They say no. However, the concept of grandfathered in prevents any kind of change from happening for a lot of these long term kind of legacy homes. So Ben talks about uh, some of these folks who have still have wood burning stoves and how we can address that. Our rules right now, and I don't have a great idea at the top of my head of how to address the, this private nuisance issue. Um, it's, it's real, uh, definitely real. Uh, I just don't have any great ideas how to address this in the short term. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but the the owners of the home, um, you know, it's their private property, and overall, the only way to get your neighbor to stop using the wood stove would be to talk to them. But there's no uh, legal authority to say, like, you can't have a wood-burning stove here since, you know, the health department has been muzzled over the course of the pandemic for a lot of things, so it's kind of hard for them to really kind of doing kind of overreaching a lot of them uh, uh, and so most of it was just like recommendations so even the greenhouse gases are not being addressed in air quality because they actually had uh, no effect on the immediate air quality so they don't actually produce particulate matter in the short term so well, that's kind of like one of the themes that seem to be going on and imagine a diesel truck spewing black smoke it's there it's kind of annoying, smells bad, but then it kind of disappears up in the air within seconds. It kind of falls under the label, if I don't see it, can it really exist? Kind of uh, ideology. That's why people are really reluctant to uh, you know, consider greenhouse gases the uh, dangerous air particulates that would cause um, air pollution. So we see our smoke-filled skies during the fire season and we can assess air quality, but not so much uh, long-term air quality impacts by greenhouse gases. If anything, they get up into the edge of our atmosphere and prevent heat from escaping the atmosphere. Of course, before I move on, I wanted to throw up uh, Daniel Carlino, who is the young rep out of Missoula City Council, who uh, have seen it from the front lines, the struggles of renting in Missoula. And so he's kind of reflecting on what uh, Rick Al Alec was, all, was um, screaming about. You know, half our town is renters, and as a renter currently, I can tell you that it's not the same as when you were a renter in Missoula right now. When the vacancy rate dropped to 0.3%, my rent at, in my whole building went up two months in a row. And every time I check the mail, I'm worried about seeing that we're going to get evicted or seeing like the rent go up. And every renter in town is feeling that, and there's no time to waste. We need to get this code reform right and and stop dilly dallying on the housing issues and put our money to the in the budget to the issues that matter the most and meeting everybody's basic needs all right so that was daniel carlino addressing the uh, city council at the very end of the meeting so this actually uh, helps change gears and switch things over to a uh, committee of the whole um this happened on wednesday morning and they were talking about the uh um 
Rogers uh, Security and how they've been working with the Pavarella Center and many of those other shelters, which include the authorized, um, the four authorized homelessness areas, Cedar Hawthorne, Johnson and North Street, authorized camping site off the Clark Fork Lane, and then the temporary outs are, uh, uh, temporary safe outdoor space. Montana James gave a presentation on how Rogers International Security has been doing for the last nine months. You know, Missoula is far from alone in trying to figure out how to navigate the increasing housing pressures uh, and the really real impacts on our residents. A lot of communities across the country are working on these same issues. And uh, this security contract is new for Missoula. Um, we're testing it. Our goal is always to improve. Um, and our purpose today is really to just offer that opportunity to reflect and share input and information with the community and better understand the impacts of shelter security on the system this year. Okay, so that was a nice introduction from uh, Montana James, kind of, uh, kind of talking about some of the uh, bigger impacts were the calls to the police, which some issues that would arise at shelters would, uh, without security, they would have to have police have more patrols, simply having a presence there to reassure homeless individuals that their possessions are safe from one another. That was one of the things that I always noticed about a lot of uh, strife and like um, maybe somebody misplaced something real quick and then they noticed that it was like, oh, you might have stolen it. And so a lot of fights usually come out of like people hoarding onto some of their stuff and feeling like some of their stuff has been taken. And it has, you know, things have been taken and things get stolen all the time. But however, the flip side was very, uh, uh, concerned about how these folks were treated and those uh, at higher risk and or have mental health issues may have an uphill battle with new folks who are authorized to use force. So Montana James talks a little bit more about the numbers in terms of uh, immediate calls to police. In the Cedar Hawthorne neighborhood, which is adjacent to the Pavarello Center's Broadway shelter, over the kind of time span between the two years, we saw a reduction in police calls and responses of 12% between the two years. And we also saw a shift in the types of calls most commonly seen in that neighborhood. Um, we saw that uh, extra patrol requests fell off that top four types of calls in the area once uh, security personnel were added. And so those are just uh, one example of the other mini neighborhoods in the city of Missoula. Um, Ricky Henderson, um, housing pro uh, programs manager, spoke on this as well, and this is what she had to say. We asked how the presence of security staff impacted safety in the immediate vicinity uh, within one to two blocks of the shelter sites. Um, and you can see here the breakdown of the Cedar Hawthorne neighborhood around the Pavarello Center, the Johnson and North uh, area near the emergency winter shelter and Clark Fork Lane near the authorized campsite. Um, on the, the Cedar Hawthorne, uh, we heard 16% felt a little or a lot less safe. 30% uh, responded feeling a little or a lot more safe. 23% res responded notice of no impact. All right, so one thing that I definitely wanted to kind of uh, uh, talk a little bit more about in terms of Roger's security and their presence there is that you know, a third of the people were like, oh, great, that's wonderful, that's good for them. And a third of the people was like, absolutely not, these guys look like they're bad news, don't want to see them, I feel like they're not doing much to help out in the my immediate safety. Um, and then the, uh, another third of the people were just like, I, I don't really care, it doesn't really matter. So I'm not going to bore you with any more of the data, but from the whole idea was like there's different um, thirds of different people and um, they talked about this in length in terms of even the staff and the security isn't just to uh, um, help the people in these uh, designated homeless sites but also was designated to um, protect them from outside sources and people who are not supposed to be there because you cr you're essentially creating kind of like a small little village of a bunch of people who have um, there's not much justice to a lot of them. So having that kind of security presence to kind of de-escalate situations was a nice thing 
from the staff's perspective. However, folks felt that the Pavarel Center was good enough with cameras in place and thought that uh, the militant look of the security was a tad overkill. Uh, staff also said that they had a great partnership with the Registered Security and it was nice to have security handle situations that could have gotten out of control. With some security being undertrained on de escalation tactics, a lot of them were learning as they went along. And this is a, a constant kind of flowing movement as well, but Jill Bonney, the director of the Pavarel Center, the homeless shelter in Missouri, talks about the impacts of the Johnson Street winter seasonal shelter and this is what she had to say. We, we had a really good year at Johnson Street. I feel like it was better than last year and partially because you learn as you go and the year before was the first year of having winter shelter at Johnson Street but I and I also think the security played a part in that. I don't think that it's all of it but I think it played a part of it all the way to our staff retention being better and I think part of that is because they felt more safe and that they had a quick response from someone who could come and interact with our guests that didn't necessarily mean that a guest was going to be arrested. Mm -hmm. um, I know that our staff really struggle to with calling the police on something that they're like, we just need them to leave. We don't want them to, you know, get in trouble with police. We just need you know, this taken care of now. And so that has really met the need without them feeling like they're just gonna get people into more trouble. Yeah. And it's never been a good optic to give somebody who has nothing, uh, tickets, fines and all that stuff. And it's like, you're just basically at this point uh, printing out new uh, toilet paper for them. So uh, throughout this meeting, uh, staff just, uh, directed the data that heavily favored Roger's security presence and staff that worked with them directly. Overall, like I've been saying, security is contracted and under more pressure, pressure to do good. Otherwise, they have a lot easier uh, way of getting rid of them as they are contracted. However, uh, there are clients at the shelter who prefer not to follow the rules and resist at every avenue. Uh, no rules, they don't like the whole idea of this. The situ these situations are usually met with even more resistance as they did not have they did have four instances of tasing for various reasons, from assault to trespassing um, to, um, yeah, there's just a lot of different things that are kind of happening there as well. These are usually the cases in which they do need to bring in the police to follow up on these incidents moving forward. So there's a couple of things that happened during this particular part of it. Um, moving on, we're going to be talking about Housing Redevelopment Community Programs Committee, and this is one of the things that I was talking about earlier is the Trinity Navigation Center. And this seems to be kind of like the, the big, the end all be all to uh, where people are going to be using services to get help for finding more permanent housing. So Trinity Navigation Center, but also has affordable housing built in with it. One of the big things that they're working with is doing an all nations um, group in, um, in which they're doing a uh, memorandum of understanding in which uh, the all nations group, which is referring to uh, native people, but now that they refer to themselves as all nations, they uh, want to include anybody and everybody with an emphasis on native um, um, tribal leadership and stuff like that. So Sky McKinney talks about the All Nations angle and this is what she had to say. All Nations has existed for just a little over 50 years um, and we really got our start providing a suite of different behavioral health services to Missoula um, and those largely focused on outpatient chemical dependency services and substance abuse services. And that was largely at the time tied to the state and federal funding that we were receiving specific to behavioral health services. Um, but we did offer just a smattering of other primary care services where we could, which was largely um, staffed by volunteer nurses um, through relationships that we've cultivated at the University of Montana with the Skag School of Pharmacy. Um, and so it really was kind of bootstrapping our operations. Oh, just move me right along, PowerPoint. <laughs> um, through a host of just different folks who would dedicate their time to, to help our patient population. And one of the biggest things that uh, Sky uh, also wanted to uh, mention during this uh, meeting as well is that the primary care has been a touch and go, but when they introduced this more indigenous providers the system improved from a uh, top to bottom in terms of age and level of care 73 percent are first born natives second born and so on that qualify for this program which has 40 percent blackfeet tribe presence throughout this program under the all nations uh, another avenue is improving paths for veterans transition out of homeless um, shelters the pavarella um, this is kind of changing gears but also within the same vein of um, dealing with folks who are um, kind of 
struggling to find housing. Um, and this was part of a $1 million federal grant awarded to the Pavarella for continuing to expanding services for homeless veterans. Uh, Tracy Pondorf talks about how they plan to move veterans out of the POV um, into more transitional housing. So this is another transitional housing opportunity, and this is what they have to say. So the Housing Montana Heroes Program has been operating on site at the Pavarello Center for the past eight years. It serves up to 20 homeless veterans, both men and women, in segregated and semi-private rooms. The Veterans Administration wants to see this program shift to a non-congregate shelter with private rooms, bathrooms, and services. This will help eliminate stressors for veterans who may need mental health support or who suffer from traumatic stress. The move will elevate the POV's ability to help veterans thrive and heal as they transition from homelessness to stable housing. The VA awarded the Pavarello Center a $1 million capital grant in support of relocating the Housing Montana Heroes Program. And so the relocation is going to the Clark Fork Motel, which is just out of uh, basically between the POV and Missoula Fresh Market. It's an old motel in which they're going to be uh, utilizing uh, the space. They're going to buy it for uh, roughly $800,000 and they're going to have 20 independent units for um, independent uh, private housing. Uh, through this federal grant, the city of Missoula has doubled rooms available for veterans. These Clark Fork motel units will be provided non-congregational keyword meaning independent for veterans taking the next step towards stable housing. It's hard out there, um, Missoula, and there are many resources like the Palvarello Center that is at the forefront of homelessness, but for those of you who were to be priced out of their homes, there are plenty of other relief programs that I'm going to uh, mention right now. Um, Homeward is a great organization meant to uh, bridge the divide for those looking for housing to buy and some rent aid. The Human Resource Council has a streamline to help pay for utilities like water and power. They had a great deal during the winter and I'm assuming they're going to have some uh, great deals if you just go to Human Re uh, the Human Resource Council District 9, which is the one that's uh, based out of Missoula. Uh, last but not least, but this is one of the big things, is that a lot of the ARPA money go into the states and to free it up, why don't we just go to the state directly? So you can go to housing.mt.gov for rental assistance for Montana. Wasn't really actually tapped into, according to some reports from the city of Missoula when they were talking about this. Get on it, people. Um, electricity is going up and everything else too. So for more information on these meetings and more, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us or log on to mcat.org to watch these meetings and more. And speaking of more, here is a promo for our summer camps. Um, let me just uh, pop this up and get it all ready. All right, so um, here's a promo, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some events that are happening in Missoula. I'm back, Spider-Man! We're going to go check these out now. Once again, a hero rises. Hey guys, we are back and we're here to talk about events. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about what you guys can do over the weekend. You know, there's always some fun things going on as well. I believe that they're still doing the lunch thing every Friday and Monday at the uh, uh, Missoula County Courthouse lawn. So it's a good opportunity for that. They do it every Friday and Monday from 11 to 1. Emphasis on a lot of food trucks in and around the uh, city of Missoula. So the Missoula Iris Society is doing a Peonies Flower and Design Show. It's going to be at the, uh, let's see, no admission fee. It's going to be at 200 South Patty Street, Missoula. It's flowers, so it's going to be outdoors. The Missoula Iris Society and Missoula Garden Club are uh, sponsoring the Iris Peony Flower and Design Show June 10th through the 11th 
at the Holiday Inn downtown. There's no admission free fee. It's just kind of come as you go, but their first official show, it starts at 11 today. Great opportunity for that as well. You have the Missoula XC, Marshall Mountain, MTCX is hosting the 10th annual Missoula XC race at Marshall Mountain. This happens all weekend long until the 12th, and, and um, Bikes is proud to a uh, duality of relaxed fun atmosphere and the Euro climbing style course that Missoula XC brings to the table. XC, XC, a lot of words, of the, just, they, they use XC way too liberally in this description, but this year's Crocs and Socks theme brings a uh, the fun in the beautiful western Montana setting of Missoula, Montana with the mountain peaks and the blue ribbon trout stream surrounding the epic trails of this course. Um, so they have the regular bike race series through Missoula and we're continuing this open bike races throughout June as well uh, with the 4 p.m. start time. But they're doing a special thing happening, um, a bike fest kind of fun activities. Like I said, the 10th annual uh, Missoula XC race at Marshall Mountain. So reimagining death, Habibi, uh, oh, Honey Bee, directed by uh, Takashi uh, Kitano. They're showing a short film uh, throughout 2022. They'll be hosting events each month featuring UN professors in the humanities who share their experience with the wider community. Professors in range of disciplines will present short lectures on topics de um, designed to generate discussion, including death rituals and beliefs around the world. African, Hindu, Irish, Middle Eastern, death experiences from past time periods, shifting attitudes about death and dying in culture, Role practices like funerals, cremation, and into life experiences. So there's a lot of uh, things happening with that. The library, it's happening tonight at 6.30 p.m. This is uh, also something that usually uh, gets uh, recorded by MCAT, so you guys can check that out as well. Uh, one thing things that I also want to mention that is there is a baseball game tonight at uh, Missoula Paddleheads Baseball Brew Fest game, Allegiansville. It's the Baseball Brew Fest. Uh, what better way than a brew fest, the br a brew fest at a baseball game? And it's exactly what they're doing. In addition to their game tickets, fans can purchase a $15 ticket to participate in beer tasting throughout the stadium with over 15 breweries from across Montana. With your Brewfest tickets, you'll receive a 10-ounce Paddleheads beer mug and two tokens and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of stuff with that as well, a lot of fun with that. Um, there's some late night events happening for Friday night as well if you're interested in going out and about. And I also wanted to mention, hold on a second, just give me a second. So uh, the Jack Saloon is going to be hosting a karaoke. You got some Monk's Bar is going to be uh, featuring some rock music with Catnip with Night at uh, Night uh, with Night Witch at Monks uh, dueling pianos. They're gonna be at uh, Stave and Hoop Speakeasy. Uh, Joan Zen is gonna be playing at the Union Club tonight. So there's a lot of things happening in and around the city of Missoula. But let's kick things off for some Saturday stuff. I don't have too much time, so I'm gonna breeze right through this. Wear It Again Jewelry Sale. Hey, St. Anthony Church is doing their seventh annual seventh annual Wear It Again Jewelry Sale, which will be held Saturday, 8 a.m. to 3:30 p.m. at St. Anthony Church. Uh, admission is. Uh, to this fundraising event is free and all ages are welcome to attend. All proceeds to benefit the programs and services for older adults, their families, and caregivers through Missoula Aging Services. Kiwanis Park Pancake Breakfast is happening tomorrow at 8.30 to about 12.30. It's going to at Orgren Park. Um, please join us for the annual Kiwanis Pancake Breakfast, revived since the hiatus of 2020 and 2021, and they're glad to be back at the old baseball field near the baseball field at their park happening um, basically breakfast time on Saturday. And also what's happening around breakfast time is your farmer's market, people's market, and the River Street Market. A lot of fun things to have uh, p locally grown produce, snacks, and also food trucks throughout this uh, every Saturday well into October. So you guys can enjoy that as well. So introduction into white water kayaking. Blackfoot River, our white water kayak clinics begin at Harper's Lake, which is three miles north of Clearwater Junction up the Blackfoot River. Clients start with an equipment overview and boat outfitting, then they'll move to the water to develop a sense of underwater comfort. Um, they'll introduce basic white water kayaking skills such as the wet exit, stern drawn, reverse and forward sweeps, rudders, forward strokes, hit snaps, and various other terms focusing on the wet exit as the most important skill in kayaking as it can really help people feel more comfortable underwater. Kayaking, there's always the chance that you're going to flip over, so you want to be able to flip right back up without getting out and doing all the whole hollabaloo of dragging it and then just launch yourself once again. So Missoula Dull and Sale is happening at the Hilton Garden Inn. Hey, it's $5, the kids are in free. It's a doll show, and it's gonna be the Hilton Garden Inn this weekend, starting at 10 a.m. And a continuation of the Iris and Peony Flower Design Show 
at tomorrow at 11. America Red Cross, uh, America Red Cross, the Pillow Case Project, at Missoula Public Library starting at 2 p.m. Also here at the Public Library is MCAT's doing our disco dances starting at um, 11 and going to about 12 and then we have some VR until about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So we're switching gears. We're not doing Saturday drop-ins and we're doing some fun things for the kids. Uh, Sunday, just want to give a nice overview of this, is that town bond birding at Fort Missoula and Quarry. Uh, once a month from April to September, um, they'll host a bird watching event at the local hotspot. Their goal is to have a good time exploring wildlife in these easy access sites, all of which are in the Missoula Valley. Forest bathing at the state of Montana Arbor Arboretum. Sorry, I'm, oh, it's easier said than read, but anyways, University of Montana is doing a forest therapy is a relative practice that brings people into deeper intimacy with nature places. These effects are really uh, collateral impacts of and repair relationship between people and places, especially those dealing with uh, ecological grief. The restoration of relationships to place is the beginning of the healing process. Forest bathing events at the route between Main Hall and the University Center. There's a suggested donation of $10. So there's the 14th annual Missoula Rights Award reception happening at the Missoula Public Library on Sunday at 2 p.m. Join us for the Celebrate the 14th Annual Writing Contest. There'll be an award presentation readings for the winners. And an e there's winners in each category. So recognition of sponsored treats and drinks. So finally, school is out for the summer and Zoo Tower Arts Community Center is doing a party on Sunday night at 7 p.m. And that pretty much does it. And I wanted to thank you guys for joining me this morning. And I'm gonna let you guys go back to enjoying some free speech TV. So without further ado, here is Wake, uh, he, he, for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott. <laughs>